Hello, everyone. I am Melissa Forziat. I am a keynote speaker, and I'm also the host of this Halt and Catch Fire Rewatch podcast. Now, when I speak, my topic is something I call Take the Donut, which is another way for me to say, seize the opportunity, go after what you want in life. And this year, something I really wanted to do was watch Halt and Catch Fire again, but actually talk about it with real life humans this time. And this has gotten bigger and bigger and better every day. And I'm getting to talk with people who worked on the show now, including my guest today, who I'll introduce in just a minute. But one quick housekeeping item before I do that. Look, if you're new to the show, if you haven't watched all the way through the series, the episode recaps are safe for you. They're spoiler free, but the interviews are spoiler filled. I don't want to you know, cause any limitations for the guests and what they say. So just be aware that you could hear some things that happened further ahead in the show, in this interview. But having said all that, I'm very excited to welcome my guest for today, who is Vaughn Campanella, who was a director on the show for, I believe it was uh, five episodes, three in season one. So we have uh, the pilot which was yeah. called IO, episode two, which was called FUD, episode 10 of season one, which was called 1984. In season two, he did episode one, which was SETI, and in season four, episode one, which was So It Goes. So yeah. got to see a bit of the whole show, really, across most of the seasons. Yeah, Welcome, Juan. I would love to do the last episode, but I couldn't, you know, it was, just couldn't do it. But uh, yes, I, I really love the show, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for thank you for doing this. Um, first of all, you just said to me right before we started recording that this was the first pilot you had ever done, which I I could not believe. So I'm going to be really curious to ask questions about that. I mean, first of all, how did you originally get the opportunity to direct Halt and Catch Fire, especially if you hadn't done a pilot yet? Yes, well, through Mark Johnson, Mark Johnson and and Melissa Bernstein, who were you know the the producers on the show. I had I had known Mark since uh, two thousand and one. Uh, he was the head of the foreign film committee at the Academy when for years for years. But also when my first movie, The Son of the Bride, not my first movie, when Son of the Bride, uh, my movie got nominated for to an Oscar for the for the foreign film. So I got to know him there. And then I worked, uh, he called me to direct an episode of a show called, um, I always forget the name of the show, you know, it's with with Simon Baker, he was, I know the whole thing, he was a lawyer, he's a lawyer who works pro bono because he's he's been punished and he has a, he's a high class lawyer, so he's a two, two worlds, you know. um, You remember everything but the name. I I, I always (laughs) see something, but I always forget the name and I had a great time in it. And then we, you know, we developed a friendship with Mark, uh, you know, really to this day, to this day, I admire him as a producer, as a, the, you know, the, the, uh, as everything. And then he was also the head of the Academy when The Secret in the Rice won the Oscar for my second nomination. So, you know, so it was a relationship that uh, had been going on for many years. And when he had this opportunity, he had, you know, they were going to do the pilot, he called me to do it. Yeah. And I had been out of American television for a long time because I had been doing an animated movie in Argentina who took me years. So so that was like my comeback to American television. What an incredible career you've had so far. So, okay, you're you're brought on board to, to start with the pilot here. What kind of research or preparation do you do to to shoot a pilot episode, not really having any not really having any material to base it off of, what do you do to prepare for it? No, well, not, you mean because of Halt and Catch Fire specifically or because of Pilot? Uh, Halt and uh, Catch Fire specifically. Yes, um, a pilot, I mean, a pilot is somewhere between an episode uh, and a movie. So, you know, I didn't have to do any research. It was really, you know, it was a uh, work as usual. You know, it's all the, all the work to, that you have to do to make a movie. Um, so the, the, the greatest thing, of course, I didn't, I didn't have to do much technical research because that was done by, by the crisis, by, by, uh, uh, by the writers. So, so Can, Canwell and Rogers, you know, so, so I didn't have to do much. I just fed off the script. I am a computer 
I, I wouldn't say addict, but I'm a computer, you know, a computer guy anyway. So I and, and I and I date back to those times. So I remember a lot of it. Uh, but mostly I had to find a, a visual approach to the show, you know, other a visual approach that was distinctive. Um, and um, and and I went back to Rodchenko, to the photographer, to the Russian photographer Rodchenko and the construct Russian constructivism. Because that was sort of like I, I thought was the first time that uh, imagery was developed through a technical breakthrough. You know, uh, there was a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that the Russian constructivists did that that were um, that were based on you know on this new theory, you know, this new technology thing, and and it had this great, especially Rodchenko had these great angles. Uh, in photos that I, I found very exciting, which were, you know, things that looked like Dutch angle, but they weren't. It was just because of the, ar the architecture. He worked a lot with the architecture and, and, the, and lines on the square, on the, on the frame. Uh, and it made it look like an angled shot, like a strange shot, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It was just a straight shot that looked like that because of all those angles. So I, I recommend everybody listening to just check out Rodchenko. R O D C H E N K O, and uh, because his photography was fundamental for the visual aspect of the show. Uh, but then we worked a lot. It was a real great, great work, I thought, with Chris Rogers and Chris Cantwell. Um, I remember all those days in the lobby of the hotel, you know, talking about the script, and 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 I think that a. Uh, um, it, it was a real great collaborate collaborative uh, work. Yes, 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 yes. They had, they knew very well what they wanted to tell, and and it was, I was great. I, I really felt very good all throughout. That's amazing. I'm, I, I'm so glad that you shared like sort of what the inspiration was for you as you created that style. Were there any directives that were given to you by, by the network or by the Chris's that sort of helped inform? It sounds like you had that that photographer as an inspiration, and then was there anything else sort of added to that? No. Oh, no, not, not visually. No, I, I made a presentation. You know, you have to do that part that I hate, you know, because I'm not a good. I always refuse to do TED Talks and all that because I, I just hate to do a presentation. And uh, But you have to do that, the show and tell, when you explain what the style of the show is going to be. So I had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, material, you know, the photos that were the inspiration, the negative space, which I used a lot also in the show. Um, so, no, they, they didn't have a, a, a directives. They, they actually let, gave me a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom. They were, they were actually asking for uh, a new, uh, uh, an inter uh, a unique visual approach, you know, to the show. So, so they were, you know, they were very pleased. Everybody, everybody was really, it was really a, a, a blessing, the, the whole thing. The AMC was great. Everybody was great. There were no problems. Sounds like wonderful creative freedom. And, uh, you know, as a, as somebody who now is doing a deep dive into the show and really looking at every scene yeah. of every episode, I just, I can see how much creativity that fostered for every other episode, even the ones you didn't do. But I am curious, you know, okay, so you do the first two episodes of the show and then other directors start coming in and start, you know, putting their stamp on it. And over the seasons, there are some, you know, some slightly different teams and maybe post-production or, so, you know, more people are adding their stamp to the show. So when you come back in at the end of season one, beginning of season two and four, you know, does that change your process at all? How how does your process change as you go into those later not episodes? In, not in visual terms, because uh, you're right. You know, directors sometimes go by the the Bible, as it, as it's called. You know, that it's set up in the in the pilot, and sometimes they detract from it. You know, and and it's a good thing. It's television. It's a it's it it's one of the pros and cons and cons of television. You know, television has a, a feeds feeds from the creativity of many people and the con might be that it loses some of the personality you know along the way you know but these are details the the detractions are are were minor most for the most part every director understood the visual things they did wonderful things they did some shots that were to, to me that was astounded that were great uh and um 
but the show also the great thing about television is that the characters it, it, it's more in terms of the script you know and everything stems from the script the characters grew in a way that uh i don't think anybody was foreseeing when we were doing the pilot um i'm, I'm sure that writers will confirm this thing you know the way the the women gr grew you know how how their relationship grew i don't think that anybody had any idea when we were doing the pilot that it was going to go that in that direction uh the way uh, lee's character uh grew you know that that came out of his performance uh, everything came, comes out of performance and uh and the greatest thing of television is that it's it's a novel that when people start reading it, not even the writers know how it's going to end. And and uh, and it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Sometimes it goes wrong, but in this case, uh, happily, it, it went pretty right. I think. I mean, I think that you can see all the seasons like a like a long movie, you know, and a very very interesting long movie. So so really, the changes when I was coming back to the show were more from the characters from what was happening with the characters, you know, not really my visual approach, no. How much of that happened in the very first episode? So like you, you know, you're working with the Chris's on the script, you know, much earlier, you know, maybe they haven't even brought in the actors yet and you're, you're developing your ideas and then you bring in the cast and you, you know, you go to start shooting it. Were there any things that surprised you in terms of the characters or the story that you were telling? Maybe things that you had in mind and then as you saw everybody come together to start working on the project, things that evolved even in the pilot? Well, um, to, to me, there was a, the, 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 one surprise, you know, no, I, I wouldn't say that there was a big surprises, you know, in that terms, because in the pilot, everybody's there. It's so um, wanting to get that part done. You know, you don't know if the series is going to go, you know, you know, you know, the, this is, this was not an order. So it was just a pilot. So the series went like months afterwards. So I don't really think that you that you see a lot of things, you see some inklings of things, you see some things in, in performances, you you saw, for example, that that uh, uh, Mackenzie it, it was way stronger than than anybody thought she would be, or at least that I, that, that I thought was stronger in terms of, of presence mm -hmm. of gravitas. Um, and um, same thing happened with the with the with the the other character with the other female character you know they, they were both they were both phenomenal they were both phenomenal and uh, they were very strong and the pilot i think was was more based on lee and and uh, and you know the, on the male on the male characters and and we were feeling the female i was you know i i, I want to i don't want to talk uh, uh, for the writers, you know, because they might have had another another idea, and they they maybe were envisioning the whole the whole thing. But uh, but I do know that even if you do have a bible, when the characters when the actors come in, things change. You know, things change. If you're if you're good, and it's a great one of the greatest things of television is that one show educates the next ones, and and you know, and it, and it changes, and it should change in an organic way. And um, so I I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that a lot of things changed. I mean, we uh, that a lot of things changed, but we started having these sort of conversations that at that point, since there was no not a series going on, you know, there were just uh, things like, uh, well, you know, if this went, I think that this character is going to go in a, in a different direction than we think, or or you know, things like that. But uh, no, not that there were actual 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 changes. Um, yeah, no, no, not, not that there were actual changes during the pilot. Mm. One of the things that this show has to balance throughout all four seasons is that obviously it's very heavy into an industry, very, very technology heavy. In the beginning, very PC heavy. And, you know, you have to balance you have viewers that have a lot of technical knowledge and you have some that have none and you're trying to sort of make the story interesting to them anyway. So in that first episode in the pilot, um, there's a whole scene that, and a lot of people, a lot of people with tech knowledge seem to love this scene where 
Joe and Gordon are working together in Gordon's garage and they're trying to figure out how to sort of crack the code, reverse engineer the IBM PC. It's an extremely technical scene, but it's also one where as somebody who doesn't have that expertise, I felt like I understood the point and the story behind what they were doing. And it felt like any good sports montage or anything, you know, like it's, it felt like something that I could understand. And I'm I'm curious because you had to really create the 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 playbook of how you were going to deal with that. Yeah. So what kind of things were you thinking of when you considered how do I keep the people with the technology and the people without it all on the same journey? Uh, easier than you would think, and and you put and <laughs> you put the finger exactly on it when you compared it with your sports montage. You know, we did have a technician with uh, a consultant. You know, who was someone who was very savvy and who would who would tell us what were the you know what, what what would be the next step and all that, and we just did it in a cinematic way. You know, knowing that it was going to be a montage, we were going some some wider shots and some tighter shots and details. Then we were doing, and that went on for a long time. Actually, we were doing. A, um, I did all the all the shots with the actors. Then we kept doing other scenes, and a, and a second unit, you know, stayed stayed and did more shots, you know, and whatever we could do. And then in the monta- and then in the editing, we decided on the whole thing. But it, but we were very everybody was very concerned that it would that it should have to be uh, realistic, that it that it really had to satisfy the most, uh, uh, you know, whatever technicians. Uh, would would be watching the show. You know, it had to be it had to be real. Um, usually, when you do a show, these are things that are not much of a concern. You know, it doesn't matter. It's a show. It's TV. It's a show. Let's go. Let's go for the impact. Let's go for what's flashy and all that. And and I think that one of the greatest things of these shows is that we we did go for that. We did go for a good show, but always keeping in mind uh, that it had to be real. Absolutely. Well, if we look at the, so I started to look into the next episode, which was FUD, and there was a space that was introduced that I want to ask about, but I also want to know sort of more broadly. So Cameron starts working in a storage room. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) She takes it upon herself to relocate offices into a, a weird looking storage room with like a fence in it and when I look at that space, there's so many really interesting shots and angles, and you just kind of came up with every possible way <laughs> that yeah. you could shoot from every direction in what mm-hmm. seems like a pretty cramped space. Yeah. So I'm curious not only about your experience shooting in a space like that, but also more broadly, are there any spaces you particularly enjoyed shooting in that location or that area across your whole, you know, five episodes? Mm, you know, it, it, in the five episodes, it, cha- it kept changing because, the, you know, the years went by. So they had, a, every time I came back, there was a different office that they were working on, you know, and it was always so exciting and a, and a, new, and a new challenge. Uh, no, the I, I do usually, I, I like to shoot with a lot of foreground, to use a lot of foreground. So cramped spaces are not a, a problem to me. Uh, if it was a set, sometimes I would I would try to do holes on the wall so I could be outside the set uh, to shoot, and and uh, and I I remember that space as a very uh, it, it was always busy. You know you you know like your background right now, your background that it has all these lines, all these straight lines and all that, and it looks very it looks very much of of a hold and catch fire. Is that from the poster? Or is that is that a, 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 I did that myself. <laughs> It would be totally in the in the style of Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> those lines, you know, it's a, and 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 I wanted to always fill the sh- the the shots with with um, with patterns, you know, with patterns, with schemes, with with a with a uh, network, and uh, and so so that show that that. Uh, um, that uh that particular set was to me was a was a blessing there's also another element that i like to work with a lot which is the 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 audience's point of view you know how how is a how is the audience watching the show and i always try to pretend 
um, that there's some that the audience is hiding in the room. So I usually I usually have one angle somewhere that is like you in the room hiding behind some piece of furniture, watching what's going on. Uh, I I kind of like that. It's I think it I think it subliminally it makes the audience feel voyeuristic. You know, you're not just showing it. You're so you're hiding. So you sort of have to look through through something to see what's going on, and it gets you more involved in the show. Because, I mean, anybody can tell a story. It's a minimum that you need to be to 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 make a movie. It's to you just have to inform the audience of what what's going on. But I think that the real challenge is to make the audience feel what the characters are feeling. So every every time there's entrapment and. And that moment, you know, that particular time in the first episodes, it was being cramped. It was, uh, you know, the being um, the environment was too much. With the one, you know, they were always lacking for space, and they were always needing uh, uh, m more space. And 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 I, well, I really like w shooting through all those things. Yeah, and I saw it, I definitely saw it in the storage room. You would shoot from behind the fence and you'd see, and you'd have to look through the fence to see um to see Mackenzie and Lee do their scene. So I, I'm gonna keep looking for that for your other episodes as yeah, well. I, I, in, in everything. I always I always like that. Well, now that I now that I spoiled it, Mary, everybody will be noticing. But <laughs> no, this is the great stuff, right? I mean, this is the stuff that we've never gotten to hear about before, and it's a new way to enjoy to enjoy the show. Um, you know, another thing I, and I'm interested to look a little bit behind the curtain on this as well. So in that same episode, so IBM is going to raid the Cardiff electric office there. Well, they're going to raid their clients. So they start poaching clients from Cardiff and it's mayhem in the office and phones are ringing and there's background noise and there's, there's people that are actually trying to deliver lines in the scene. And you're, you're trying, you're trying to get a sense of the fact that their business is crashing before your very yeah. eyes. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of panic. And I'm curious when you're shooting a scene like this, what's actually happening on set, how much of this is added later in post versus how much of it is happening right there in real time with you? No, in this show, I mean, you mean in terms of sound, in terms of in, in terms of the, you know the finished experience versus what what you would have experienced on set. You know, how much of it is 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 taking place there? What is the energy like no, when you're yeah, filming? Well, no, you know, it's a it's a. It's an interesting thing. No, that's a, that's an illusion. I mean, the illusion of chaos is an it's an illusion that's created in the in the in the editing of it. Uh, a set where chaos reigns is not a good set, you know. So so <laughs> it's true that we create, you know, we we put the cameras, we know what the space is, and when we say action, chaos is created. You know, people run. I I don't remember specifically the 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 shots that we use, but I'm. I'm very uh, having worked a lot in low budget and in Argentine movies and all that. You know, I I, uh, I know how to fill a frame. That if you move the camera just one foot to the side, you'll see that it's an empty place, but that it looks full and chaotic. And that's that's the uh, that's what you do. That's when you do an action scene or a battle scene. You know, it's a it's not it's not that chaos before anybody says action. Actually, it's very carefully rehearsed all where, where the extras go, where, what they should do. Um, so when you say action, everything happens. And when you say cut, it's quiet again until, <laughs> until the next one. Yes, it's not, it's not chaotic. You do have, you know, something does happen, which is when the, when the, if the shot is long enough, you know, and people are in that, in that mode that they're acting like that, they develop their own adrenaline. You know, obviously the body, the body doesn't know if, if, if the excitement is real or, or, or it's acted. So they develop their adrenaline and there's some excitement that once, once that someone says cut and people just keep talking in a loud voice and all that and you have to remind everyone, please, you know, please be quiet so you can think because you, usually when scenes like that happen, you also have a lot of people communicating, giving cues to people and all that, you know, so you, you need to hear and sort of be quite ordered it's it's really there's there's a lot of strategy going on in, in those in those scenes mm. so if we look at season one episode 10 which was called 1984 one thing that we're going to see uh, i think for the first time here it's the first appearance of the mutiny house which is going to be 
a, a very prominent location in season two. And I, my understanding is that it was originally a house that you shot in and then they be, it became a set for, it was turned into a set for season two. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, so you actually shot in a house. Can you tell me a bit about... From the, like from the pilot to the episode two, everything was a real house and then became a set. Everything was a real, the office was real. I was always amazed that people would not notice the difference because the office in the episode one is real and in episode two in the pilot is real and in episode two is a set. Mm. Uh, a set that reproduces the real, the real office, but it's bigger, you know, it, it, with different sizes and everything. Same with the house of the of the of the Clarks. What so, do you remember about shooting in that house? No, I don't I don't know. No no specific anecdotes or Yeah. Oh, that, but that was another that was another set that had to look the mutiny the mutiny house had to look again that this is a bunch of of uh, of nerds who, who who don't care at all about order, or you know, who are very uh, uh, chaotic in in their way. So in in the set, all, also we had to reproduce that. I remember there was a long shot, there was a long oneer that we did that went all around the house, all through the house. Uh, um, I was going to ask about that. That was the very that was the next episode that you did. That was season yes. two. That was episode one. Yes, exactly. what a brilliant way to open yeah. that seems like it was really care uh carefully choreographed uh, you what tell tell and uh, robert komatsu was saying a little bit also about working on that as well in his interview I'm sorry, who, who, who? robert komatsu uh-huh um so i'm curious like what what went into that from your standpoint it was, it was, it was choreographed but we had to you know we sort of we wanted to set up there were several things that we wanted to set up. First of all, of course, the script, you know, so we had to set up the chaos of the of the place, how it connected, but we also wanted to set it up geographically. And so so I thought it was very, it was interesting to actually see, not with cuts, but to see how people move from one place to the other. Uh, so ironically, those, those, those shots are maybe harder to, chore obviously harder to choreograph, but you end up doing the whole scene in less time than you would do if you were setting up different shots. And I think that it's much more original. Um, so I guess, I think I remember that shot was half a day, more or less, uh, which, which uh, if we had, if we had shot it in different shots, maybe that whole scene would have been a whole day. You know, so once people get choreo get the choreography, they get in a movie. It's so they're fun to do. You know, they're very exciting creatively. The actors get to act the whole scene together. They feel also it's also good for them because they feel the space as a as a stage. You know, so as a as a uh, as a house, as a house that's lived in. They they really get to walk around. You know, do the whole thing that they would as they would be doing in real life. So it serves many purposes, both on and on screen and, and backstage. Hmm. I mean, it, it was brilliant. And also it, it really fit with the energy of that house that we were going to see through the rest of the season, because like you said, it's a chaotic space and there's a lot of people in it. And so that to have that kind of movement happening in the house to open up the season feels very appropriate. There's in the next episode that you did, there's another, it looks like a one or, but I know it's not where, you know, you're, you opened up season four, episode one with that long. Yes. Yes. With yes, Gordon. Yes. Yeah, no, that's not, that definitely not a, not a, not a, not a real one. You know, that's a, would be impossible. <laughs> it would be impossible because there are changes in the actors and everything. Yes. So yes. Uh, the, um, oh yes, 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 yes. I, I remember that when, when, uh, when they sent me the script, I said, you know, I would love to do this as a winner. And Chris Rogers told me, we we thought so. We were sure, we were betting that you were, <laughs> you were wa wanted to do it as a winner. Yes, it was great. He actually has to have, in one of the shots, he has to have a little bit of a help of an effect because of a light, a lighting change. I think that uh, uh, Scoot was on the phone and, it, and light changes behind him. Um, but uh, yes, that was that was a lot of fun to do. Yes, to have that that uh, montage again, it gives it it gives it a when when you don't cut 
you know, it gives it a real a reality thing. And sometimes you don't see everything, you know, like if you were doing with cuts, everybody would want to see everybody's face all the time. And in this kind of shot, sometimes you have a whole lines on the back of somebody, uh, uh, on somebody's back. And, uh, but it just doesn't matter because you're there, you're there, the real, you know, it, it uh, and it really creates a dynamic that it's not cut. So it's, so the energy builds up. Uh, I really like I really like Wanners very much. And it's interesting because the two we just talked about feel very different as a viewer. You know, the 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 Mutiny House um, Wanner really has a frenetic energy to it, and it makes you feel like that office is alive. And in season four, the way it opens, it's a long sequence, and it's got that flow, but yet it's more about okay, we're moving through time. Yeah. And, and for me, it also asked me to remember that Gordon is sick because mm -hmm. there's something about it. That's almost a little bit fever dream quality. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like, is this happening or is this in Gordon's brain? And so it's a little bit of this weird, like, and um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the light because one of the things that will happen a lot in season four up until Gort, spoiler uh, for those who didn't listen, up until Gordon's death, um, I'll, there are a lot of lens flares. There's a lot of light being, being played with behind him. How much did you know about where where the season was going for you to be able to no, set I, any I, of that I, up? I, I knew I knew he was going to, I, I knew he was going to die, but I did not know uh, the, the scripts weren't written, uh, so they they had. I'm sure they had a. a uh, synopsis of the whole thing. Um, not that they weren't, I, I don't want to say they weren't written. Obviously, if I was shooting episode one, they had more scripts written, but not the whole, the, se the whole season wasn't written. So, so I did not know. No, I did not know. And I don't know if they had told me if I'd asked, you know, I, this, these are things that are kept very much in secret. So, so it's interesting. So maybe the maybe it was sort of a happy accident for the other directors that you had had this light what, thing happen what, what you the interpretation that you're giving it uh it might be it might be a happy accident yes i don't think that i i was i i don't remember working with a, a progression in gordon's uh illness i don't i don't think so i don't now now you make me doubt because it just feels so perfect you know <laughs> it is so perfect I, I i'm just so delighted that it happened even if mm -hmm. you know you weren't all working specifically towards that but it feels very intentional from later directors that they started playing more and more with light with sort of like flares that were happening in scenes around him and then it becomes very prominent obviously in episode seven but he, mm -hmm. you know it feels like there's a progression so yeah. it's amazing that you you did something to sort of plant that seed and other people kind of ran with it and, but you know, but that's something that happens even um, that happens in television. It's like in the process of writing a script. Sometimes you don't know the, you know, you don't know exactly uh, how things are going to end, and you take something of a, pre, you know, that you wrote without thinking of it as a setup for something that would come in later, and you take it. Well, the most the most obvious one and unknown ones is uh, is the end of Casablanca. You know, where they didn't know how to finish it. And then the writers looked at each other and they said, round up the usual suspects, which was a line that they were using before in the script without knowing, without knowing that it was going to be used at the end. And now it looks like it all it was all set up for that ending, you know. So the same thing happens in television a lot, you know, like that thing that happened by chance or because it seemed like a nice scene or, or a nice uh, visual or whatever, for whatever reason that is made in one earlier episode. And someone comes in and and fits on it and 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 takes it to another dimension. I, it, it, it's a it's great. It's a great thing. It's one of the greatest things of television. And sometimes it's why we have problems in remembering who had the idea. You know, it's like a, it it just been transformed and grew and and developed by so many people that you just forget who had the original idea. Mm. In that same episode, we get a whole blue man group performance. Yes. And I can't even imagine what it would have been like to work with them on set. So what was 
What what was that day of shooting? <laughs> I um I I think that they I think you should ask the critics, but I think that they did it almost almost as an an homage to me too, because I am such a fan of the Blueman Group. You know, I had seen them the first time in 1998 and I, and I'd seen them like like seven times so I had fo- I took photos with them and everything you know on that day uh it was just great no it was great uh they um it it, it wasn't difficult at all they know their act very well you know they they uh, they had thought previously what they were going to do we knew exactly um well, not exactly, but pretty much what was going to be on their act and what was going to be part of the of the background, you know, with the other when when the other characters spoke. Uh, so it was just a pleasure. It was a real pleasure. It was one night I remember exactly that night. Yes, 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 yes. It was a real pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, once the paint starts flying, there's no there's no doing it again. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing thing to think about. Um, you know, in this episode, we haven't talked a lot about Donna, but season four, Donna starts very different than we've ever seen Donna. She's got a harder edge. She's savage. She's ruthless. And you have to basically set the stage for that in this episode. So, you know, what kind of things were you doing to, because a lot of it comes across in a montage. So, you know, what kind of things are you doing to make sure that this complete, like, shift of energy for this character is communicated? A lot of it was Carrie's performance, you know, was Carrie's performance, the costumes, the the office where she where she uh, where she was working. Um, I um, and the script, of course, and the script, you know, it wasn't it wasn't much. I mean, when you add all that up together, there isn't, I mean, all the differences are there, you know, it's not that I had to shoot it in a different way. Um, so, so no, I, I remember that we had to, I, I wanted to exacerbate or, or underline in a, in a, in a visual way that she was separated from the, from the crowd, you know, though she was, she sat in the, in the opposite, it was a long table and she sat on the opposite end the window was behind her, so she was backlit. Uh, the um, and and therefore the other guys couldn't see her face exactly, you know, very very well. So there were little there were little things, there were little things with angles, you know, when you shoot them a little lower angle or things like that. But not much more. A lot of it was was Carrie's performance. Carrie's such a she's such a joy to work with for you know for a director in every in every sense as a person. Every I mean the whole the whole cast. The whole cast, but Carrie particularly was a was a great uh, was a great joy to work with. Uh, she, um, you know, for for many reasons in the pilot, I in the pilot I I realized that at one point I was paying much more attention to Scoot's character than to her, and I, and I, and it was basically because also she nailed it in every in the first take. You know, she nailed it every, in all the time in the rehearsals, and I had to come to her and say, look, I, I, it's not that I'm not paying attention to you. It's just that you nail it from the beginning. I don't have many notes to you because you don't need notes. You know, I, and I kept having to tell her that because I don't want, you know, sometimes an actor might feel, uh, oh, he's not saying anything to me, you know, if he's not paying attention to me. And it was just that she was, she was great. I mean, I don't, I don't think I ever, uh, Ask her to do something differently than than what her instinct was. Mm. Uh, she was she was great, um, and um, so I remember in that fourth season that she wasn't. She, she nailed it, you know. She nailed it because she was the same character. She, she wasn't playing a different character. It was the same character with a little bit more authority, and uh, you know. So so it was perfect. It was a perfect extension, you know. To me, I hadn't done any episode on, on season three because I was doing another show at that time I was doing Colony was another show and I was so sorry that I couldn't be on, on, on season three and uh, and I was amazed by the the journey that the characters of the two you know of Mackenzie and Carrie had had gone um, and uh, and that was just uh, you know just a pleasure. 
Well, the detail of the watch, the reversible watch, was that something that had been scripted from the beginning or is that something that was like found by the costume department and worked in or it's such an interesting detail of like she'd go into a meeting and flip over the watch to the gear side. Yes. And then she'd flip it back when she was like ready to be human again. <laughs> was, no, that was in the script. Yeah. That was in the script. Yes. Holy yes. smokes. What a specific prop to have to get. Um, <laughs> amazing. Some of the, some of like the period elements that were brought in and from the different departments. Um, one other small, well, it's probably small for you, but it's, it mystifies me. It's like a magic trick. So the end of this episode is going to basically roll into the beginning of the next episode where a Cam and Joe start to have a phone conversation. And then the next episode is entirely them having a phone conversation. So where you leave off with them, Cam is sitting on the bed. She's talking to Joe. She tells some, Joe something important, and and then the scene is is over. Except you know it's going to be the entirety of four o two. How do you um, like just behind the scenes? Like, uh, did you have to coordinate with the director for the next episode, or is that something? No, there needs to be some kind of continuity. Sometimes, there. sometimes it is done. Yes, yeah, sometimes it is done, uh, but not in this case. Not in this case. Uh, no. No, 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 no. Uh, so there were just continuity experts on hand. No, I don't. I don't remember. The ed the director, of course, was there because uh, you know that's the way it works on television. When you're shooting an episode, that ne the next director is doing pre-production. So I don't remember. I don't remember talking about it. I don't mm. remember talking about. It. Uh, so. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. I don't have... <laughs> No, it's just interesting. I mean, but they were on set, so they would have been able to to pick up on, they maybe they take were, notes. They weren't necessarily on set, you know, but they, you do see when you have a continued episode, you know, you, uh, to be continued, like, kind of like that, you, you see what the other director was doing, you know, to sort of feed, uh, you know, feed from it. And as, as I was telling you before, you know, you see what the other person was doing, see if the, if you, can add something without changing the nature completely, and that's that. That's the that's the greatest thing to me when I when I look at other directors' work uh, in television in a show that I that I'm working, especially in a case like this. I just want to see where they took it. You know, it's almost like that game where you have that that you say one line to the next person and they have to add a word, and then and just then at the then at the, at the end of the line is a completely different sentence. So that's a uh, that's what happens. And I and you have to get to enjoy that. You know, you have to get to enjoy it. That's why I do movies too. So so the in the movies no one does, no one changes what I what I do. But here you have to enjoy this kind of passing the baton to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any other scenes or anything behind the scenes that you wanted to mention, you know, something that you want us to know about Halt and Catch Fire that maybe I didn't ask about? Well, in, in talking about this, there was one character that I'm sure changed completely from the pilot to where it ended because of the actor who was playing it. And it was uh, Bosworth. It was Toby Hass, Toby Hass's character. Uh, you know, the character as envisioned by the writers and myself and Mark and, and everybody, when we read the script, was a, a, a very proper patrician Southern man, you know, more of a very white uh, um, businessman, you know, like a very, very uh, conventional, um, you know the 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 big business guy, um, and Toby comes in. I didn't know I didn't know Toby. I work with him in color. I work with him. I I will work with him in anything. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and Toby comes in and and does his reading, which is completely different from what a, anybody thinks. You know, I think that Toby is it's hilarious. Also, he's he is a hilarious human being. So he 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 added humor to it, and and the character was a little bit more untidy. Uh, he wasn't that impressive. He wasn't that impressive businessman. 
he had a little bit of a sleazy thing. Um, but even like a bit of a New Yorker kind of thing, you know, like a, like a, <laughs> uh, though he was doing a, this this southern accent that was very funny. Um, so I, I loved him. I loved him. To me, he like completely obliterated the image that I had of the character. I I loved Toby, and there was a lot of conversations about casting Toby or not. Um, not because anybody disliked Toby, but just because he was so different from what the character was when, when it was envisioned when they wrote the script. Um, to the point that we had another actor who, who I love too, who was that proper, I'm not gonna mention him, you know, but he, <laughs> he, uh, um, he, was, he was that image, you know, he was that image that, that was originally uh, uh, written as. And we got to a, to a, to a finals, you know, they both came in and they both made the, the, the audition and each one, it was a very, very, very hard creative choice because they were both great. They were just completely different characters. You know, the, the, there was no parameter to compare them. You know, it was just a choice of what direction to go with a character. And luckily Toby, you know, Toby uh, got the part and because his character, my God, he changed so much. You know, he changed so much. And I thought that him and Mackenzie did a did a uh, this great couple, you know, this great uh, working couple. And and it was just I, I would say that it's the uh, Lee's character and Toby's character were the characters that changed that really changed completely directions because of who were playing them. No. I'm curious how Lee's character changed. I totally agree with you on Toby. I think he, uh, I mean, so he brought so much heart to the role. Oh, yeah. um, and it turns out that it really feels needed. But with Lee, it's almost hard to imagine that that was not the vision for his character. So like on the page, what did it start as? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be unfair. Maybe the, the Chris, Chris and Chris uh, had this plan all along. But at the beginning, Chris uh, Lee was a, was a, uh, was more of a, of a of a of a hero, you know, the hero, the hero guy, the the go getter, the Steve Jobs, the 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 fast talker, uh, businessman, you know, more cruel businessman or cold business, not cruel, but cold businessman, um, which is a lot of what he is in the first episode, you know, and uh, and so him having him having uh, this uh, storyline about his sexuality about his his personal life and all, all that i don't think that was not again i don't want to be unfair but i i don't at least we never talked about it we never talked about it when we were doing the pilot you know it was it was a it, it, it was a, one of the greatest things and I, and i think it's great that the writers picked it up i mean that's a great the the main thing about writing for television in something that goes on for different seasons is to embrace your actors is to embrace your actors and see what they can do see what their strong points are uh and not try to make them fit your molding but you know it, it all works together you know it just all works together and lee had a, a a much more sensitive side to him. I mean, Lee is a is a very impressive looking guy. You know, he's a very tall guy, very good looking guy. He is like this, this sort of suave. Uh, um, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, the, in my English is 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 maybe you didn't notice, but it's not my native language. So. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, what an incredible interview, and not your native language. <laughs> I just. Yeah. But, <laughs> wow! But uh, uh, the, you know, he he can be this very imposing guy. You know, uh, he's not in real in real life. He's the sweetest man. You know, but but the, he can be he can be that and and and, and embracing a whole sensibility that you can see that he has when you start dealing with him in a in a more, you know, in a more uh, in the day to day. You know, and talking about characters and scripts and all that. You you start seeing that he can, that he has, there's so much more to him and, uh, and, and they embraced it and went with it. So I think that, uh, 
the other character, I don't know. I don't know if they had the plans of for dying at the end. I did. I don't know if if that was in the in the in the plan. But the character change the 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 changes, the deeper changes in the character. I think that Toby's and Lee's are the are the the ones that are so something that no one in the pilot was talking was talking about. That's amazing to hear. And it's it's fun to have that viewpoint from somebody who's who was there before it was on air, you know, like before the first episode, you were part of the how it got made. So uh, this has been so wonderful. Are there any projects that you're working on now or that maybe that are going to be released soon that we should keep an eye out for? You know, I, I work on the uh, after the quarantine, I'm, I have been working a lot on Law and Order SVU because that's the show. I love them all there. That's the show that gave me my first chance in prime time 25 years ago already. And I and I always go back and great friends with Mariska Hargitay and and you know and, and I have a lot of fun. It's like a high school reunion other than that it's also a great show. So I go back there and I'm developing stuff. I just I keep doing movies and stuff. You know, I just do all my usual thing. I have a, this this thing that you see behind me I built a theater in Buenos Aires, so that's my theater, and uh, and wow. and I'm working on that a lot. You know, luckily, luckily, right now the two plays that we have the more are successful, so I don't have to be there. But it's uh, yeah, that I've been when I was noticing all the changes happening in film and all that, I I got a theater, so that's not going to go away. <laughs> wow, wow, what a what a a movement that you made there for the community. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I really love the live theater. Yes. Uh, well, this is this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us so much of your time to talk about this show. It's clear that you loved the show and still do. The show and everybody involved. So it's nothing but good memories. Yes. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that. Well, thank you so much, Juan, for joining me. And okay, everybody, go out there, watch Halt and Catch Fire. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.